your Bible, turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I'm going to settle in here and give you a couple of introductory comments, and then we're going to get into this message. Since I started preaching here as pastor in the month of February, I believe that I have not yet devoted a whole message to preaching about prophecy yet. Those of you who have known me for years and years and who were here before when my dad was pastor, when I would fill in for him and on uh, our Sunday school hour, I love prophecy. I've taught through a lot of it before and looked at different aspects and tried to talk about particulars of it. Like, well, is the rapture before the tribulation? And what's the difference between the rapture and the actual coming of Christ to the earth to rule and to reign? as king. And as I thought about it and prayed about it, someday I may take a series, probably you do that type of thing on a Wednesday night, and just try to go through all of the scripture in the Bible that pertains to these end time events, which if I were to do that would probably take an entire year to go through and cover things verse by verse. So this morning it won't be focusing on one particular aspect, like I said, of differences between the rapture and between the coming and the timing of it, though as we look at the scripture, several of those topics will come up. What I thought about was if I had one simple message to sort of prove and apply the rapture from the Bible, how would I approach that? So we will look at several scriptures as the Lord gives us time to look at them individually one by one and break them down and apply them, but it's going to be a little bit more of an overview and sometimes I may reference a whole section of scripture or a topic and it may be something that you might want to look into more on your own and to study, but I believe that this is what the Lord would have me to do this morning. So if you would pray for me, like I said, I know, I feel it. This is the Word of God. I believe it with all my heart, and we'll get into the text here in just one moment. So here we go with the introduction. Are you ready? There was a man named J. Barton Payne, and according to him, he mapped out the Bible and said that he discovered 1,239 prophecies in the Old Testament and 578 prophecies in the New Testament. This would make a total of 1,817 prophecies in the Bible. I have not mapped this out for myself, so some of this I'm sure could be debated as always when you break it down and look, but he claimed that those 1,817 17 specific prophecies were mentioned over the course of 8,352 Bible verses. So on average, that would mean somewhere around four and a half verses were devoted to each prophecy. Maybe one specific prophecy he was counting. When you look at the whole context of it, there's 40 verses in this chapter that are talking about one particular event that is a prophecy. At any rate, that's how he broke it down. If those numbers were accurate, the Bible itself itself has 31,102 verses, Old and New Testament, put together. And if 8,352 of them are dealing with some type of prophecy, that would mean that approximately 26.8% of all verses in the Bible have to do with prophecy of some sort or another. Many of them have been fulfilled already, but many of them have not. I say all this before we get started to point to the fact that you can't can't really just ignore prophecy and be a faithful Bible teacher. I understand there's a lot of people who say, well, I don't want to get too far off into the weeds and I'll let other people have their specialties and their stuff that people worry about that I'm not going to get too far into. And there's nothing wrong with that. But we can't approach teaching the Bible and say we're just going to ignore whatever has to do with future events and actually be faithful to what we are called to do because according to those who broke it down, approximately one-fourth of our Bible Bible has to do with prophecies. There are also many events that are unequivocally yet to be fulfilled. The Old Testament prophesied that Jesus Christ would be born of a virgin, that He would be born in Bethlehem, that He would pay for the sins of all mankind. Those prophecies have been fulfilled already. But as we look to this future prophecy and events like the rapture, second coming, ruling and reigning of Christ on the earth for a thousand years, not only does the book of Revelation talk about many of those things, but wide chunks of the New Testament talk about those things, and wide chunks of the Old Testament talk about those things. 
things. The book of Zechariah and Isaiah, Jeremiah, even the Psalms contain a lot of prophecies about the Messiah coming and setting up his kingdom on earth and ruling as sort of an end of days event. And we've talked about it before, but that's why his disciples were so confused and John the Baptist was confused. And they were like, when are you going to set up your kingdom? When are you going to beat these Romans back who are oppressing us, sit on your throne and rule over all the nations of the earth from Jerusalem like the Old Testament says you're going to. And he had to tell them over and over again, yes, it's prophesied I will be king and ruler of the earth, but it's also prophesied in Isaiah 53 and Psalm 22 that I would die for your sins. And what I want you to understand is that right now I'm here to die for your sins. I'm going to ascend back up to heaven. But then Jesus also talked over and over and over again about a time in the future when he said I'm coming back to this earth to fulfill all of those prophecies where I will rule and reign as king. It wasn't spelled out in the Old Testament that he would come once to die for sins and then once he would come to reign as king, but he had to get them to accept, I'm God, this is my plan, this is the way that I am going to fulfill it. In like manner, as we look to the future, we believe that there is an event where Christ will come to the earth and set his feet upon the earth and rule and reign over all the nations, just like the Old Testament says. But we also believe there is an event that we have come as the church to call the rapture. Now, if you have discussions with some people and they want to debate different aspects of it, you may hear someone say, the word rapture isn't even in the Bible. And it's true. But did you know that the word Bible isn't even in the Bible? The word rapture does not appear, but the event of what we would call the rapture absolutely does appear. Let's look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse number 13, and here we go. Lord, help us. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. This is the Apostle Paul writing here to this church. And he says, don't be ignorant about them which have died in the Lord. Okay, that's what he's talking about. Other Christians who have already died went to heaven and are with God. Verse 14, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, let me stop there for one moment this morning. Do you believe that Jesus died and rose again? Yes. It's a given. He's writing to the church. He's not bringing up the question, do we really believe that Jesus died and rose again? He's making a comparison and he says, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, as the Bible tells us that he did, we, we've hung our faith, our entire eternity on the fact that he did. If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, look at the next half of the verse. Even so, so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Now, we note there that the context is he's talking about bringing those saints who've died before with him. But just for a moment, focus on the fact that it says God will bring with him. If he's going to bring people with him, that means he's coming. And the Apostle Paul links the future event where he comes with the past event where he died and rose for our sins and equates them and says if we have faith that he truly was God, died, rose again, paid for our sins, then we believe he's coming again because he promised he would come again. Verse 15, for this we say unto you, by the word of the Lord. This is not our ideas, these are God's words. That we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. The word prevent there means precede or to come before. We're not going to jump in front of them. We're not going to cut them out. Christ is going to bring them with Him. But notice the phrase there I have underlined in verse 15. We which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord. There will be a generation of Christians. That's what he's talking about when he says we which are alive and remain in their day. They were expecting maybe Christ will come back before we die. We don't know when He's coming but we know that in the future there will be a generation of Christians that do not die. Because they will be alive and remain unto what? The coming of 
the Lord. Verse 16, For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then, notice the same phrase, We which are alive and remain, what's going to happen to us, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. The Greek word there for... Notice the phrase, caught up. We will not die, but rather there will be a generation. I know I'm repeating myself, but it's very basic right from the text. A generation of Christians that do not die, but they will be caught up together into the clouds to meet Jesus Christ Himself. And from that point forward, we are going to be with God forever. The phrase there, caught up, translated into English from the Greek word harpazo is how you would pronounce it when you're trying to say it in English and don't really know Greek like I do. Harpazo. And what it means is a catching up, a snatching away. It's the clearest verse in the Bible that talks about what we would call the rapture. We have it right here in the text. Jesus comes in the clouds and catches away His church. As I said before, I believe that at the end of the seven-year tribulation period, Jesus will come to earth with the church, defeat the Antichrist and his enemies, and will reign for a thousand years from Jerusalem. But I believe that this is a separate event with a separate purpose because they are described differently. One, Jesus comes down from heaven out of the clouds, separates out those who are unsaved before he sets up his kingdom. But here Jesus comes in the clouds and catches up his church, those who are saved to the clouds. One is the rapture and one is the coming of Christ physically to the earth at the end of the tribulation period. Now let me give you some definitions of what different people think uh, compared to what I think, what I believe, and then we'll get into a couple of points and try to apply this. Some people try to claim that all of the future prophecies of Christ coming back have been fulfilled already. This is a doctrine called preterism. And They say, well, in 70 AD, all of these prophecies were already fulfilled because all of them were figurative. I cannot approach the Bible and give any weight to the fact that that could possibly be true. In 70 AD, Jesus did not come in the clouds, physically touch the earth, separate all the peoples of the earth, condemn those who were lost, and then set up an earthly kingdom and rule and reign over them for 1,000 years. The problem is, if we were to look at every single one of those specific prophecies that were given in such detail, so clearly, and allegorize them away... There would be nothing in this Bible that we could not allegorize and explain away. The prophecies are just too specific. Now, the millennial kingdom of Christ is that event which is spoken of in Revelation chapter 20. He'll sit upon the throne in Jerusalem and rule for a thousand years. It fits right hand in hand with all of those Old Testament prophecies. Like I said in the book of Zechariah, it says the Messiah, will his feet shall touch the Mount of Olives. It will split in half. He'll walk across. He'll defeat his enemies. And he will rule over all the nations of the earth. So what we say is that we are pre-millennial Baptist or pre-millennial Christians. On the heading of the sword of the Lord and other papers where they describe their distinctives, they say we are pre-millennial. What that simply means is that Jesus Christ is going to come and then following His coming there's going to be an actual millennial kingdom. It's what the Bible teaches. There are two other groups of people who would describe themselves as post millennial Christians or as all millennial believers. What both of those terms mean are they don't believe Jesus will actually have a thousand year kingdom. It's all figurative. They don't actually believe it. I know I'm getting off in the weeds a little bit this morning, but if you could stick with me, we're going to get to the text. We're going to keep it simple. What we believe, and I've probably spent a little bit too much time on all of this in years past, but I love it. It's the word of God. I think I spent seven hours listening to a partial preterist debate, a full preterist that nonsense. Cessationist. You don't really need all that, but I'm just trying to give you some definitions 
to build upon. Those who are amillennial believe that we are in the millennial kingdom now because it's all figurative. And when it talks about the marriage supper of the Lamb and Christ spending time with His church, those are saints who have died and gone to heaven. And eventually, when all that's over, He's going to come down to the earth. Now, the problem with that, and also with post-millennial, is that they say, well, the devil's been bound in this current age. And if you think the devil's been bound right now... I don't know. We're going to have to talk about that. What the post-millennial people believe is, again, the millennial kingdom is a figurative time wherein that Christians become so involved in the human realm that the world eventually becomes more and more Christian, that it eventually gets better and better, and that Satan is bound, and that there will be this golden age where persecution fades out, and that through the work of the church, the whole earth basically becomes Christian and ready for God, and then God just shows up to take the throne because we're all ready for Him to get here. If you've been watching the news, that view is just not working out very well. I don't believe that's what the Bible teaches. I believe Jesus will come. And then the millennial kingdom is a literal teaching of the Bible that will happen. Now, as to the event of the rapture that we just read in 1 Thessalonians 4, the catching away of the church, that within premillennial believers, meaning he's going to come, then there's a millennial kingdom, there's also a split into three different views. Pre-tribulation is what I believe. I believe Jesus will come and then there will be a seven-year period described by the prophet Daniel in Daniel chapter 9. If anyone is interested, our website has a link to sermons. And if you go to series and scroll down, we did an eight-week series on Daniel chapter 9, Daniel 70-week prophecy, where we went a little bit more verse by verse and took our time. If you find that kind of thing interesting, you're welcome to go back and listen to it. But what Daniel said is that there will be a figure that the New Testament calls the Antichrist that will make a covenant with the Jews for seven years and that they will begin rebuild the temple and begin to put their sacrifices back in place and that halfway through that seven year period that Antichrist will turn on the Jews he won't allow them to make the sacrifices he'll proclaim himself to be God and require all that live upon the earth to worship him to worship his image and to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead and you will not be able to buy or sell unless you receive that mark in your body. So what I believe is that before that seven year period begins that Daniel tells us about and that Jesus talks about, Christ is coming for his church and he's coming in the rapture. Reasons for why I believe that we'll unpack a little bit when I get to my outline, which I'm trying to get to as quickly here as I can. The other beliefs are mid-tribulation, that the rapture will happen halfway through that seven year period. And then the other belief is a post-tribulation coming, that will at the end of that seven year period where the Antichrist is reigning, then Christ is going to rapture His church. I'll give you a few reasons as we go along for why I believe in the pre-tribulation rapture, but this I'll say. If you think He's coming halfway through or at the end, I don't really agree, but I'll go have lunch with you either way. I'm not that worried about it. But to deny that He is coming is to deny the Word of God and is to deny the very clear, plain teachings of Jesus Christ. To say, well, He's not coming back to earth at all would be heresy. To say, well, I think He's coming in a little bit of a different timing than you think, that's something we can talk about and still love each other as Christians. Okay, that leads me to number one, the certainty of the rapture. Number one, the certainty of the rapture. This rapture is the event we read about in 1 Thessalonians 4, we which are alive and remain being caught up together in the clouds. There was a man named Harold Camping who had a Christian ministry and family radio where he preached the Word of God. And throughout his history in that ministry, he had five failed attempts at predicting the date of the rapture. Beginning, I think, back in the 80s or 90s, he said, Judgment Day is going to be this specific date. And then it didn't happen. And he said, well, my calculations were off a little bit. Now it's this date. And it didn't happen. Then a third time. Well, something big's going down this date. And then a decade went by. And I believe in the 2000s, he said, well, now I've figured it out. It's this date. It didn't happen. And then one more time he said, well, that was a spiritual rapture. But the actual rapture is this date. And it failed again. What he failed 
to consider and to believe is one of the very basic elements of the rapture, which we'll talk about in just a moment, is number two, is that the coming of Jesus Christ is imminent, meaning it could happen at any moment. Jesus Christ Himself told us a sign of a heretic is someone who says they know exactly when Jesus is coming. Matthew 24, 36, speaking of these end-time events, Jesus said, But of that day and hour knoweth no man... No, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. At another point, Jesus said, Of that day and of that hour, even the Son of Man, I don't even know, but only God the Father knows. And if you know exactly what He meant by that and how that all worked out, that Jesus could say even He didn't know when it was, then come talk to me after church and you can explain it to me. Because I have a hard time with that one. But what most Bible commentators believe is that while He was in the flesh, He intentionally withheld some of the knowledge that He had available to Him. At any rate, if Jesus said, no man knows the day or the hour, and even I don't know, only God the Father knows, that should be enough Bible for us to stop trying to predict when it's going to happen. The whole point was we have to be ready. Now, around that time in the 2000s when Harold Camping tried to predict it, some people had parties that they called end of the world parties. And they got drunk and they did things and they mocked the fact that he said the world was going to end and Jesus was going to come. I'll say he deserved to be mocked for that because he was going against the clear teachings of the Bible. I just wanted to note, as I looked up the details, it's always noteworthy to say the man claimed that he repented and said it was sinful for him to try to predict the date and that he was going to obey the Bible from now on. Did he mean that? Was he just trying to cover for himself? No one knows the hearts of people but God, but it's noteworthy and a good thing when someone who's off into false teaching says, I repent of that, and they should be commended for doing so. But I'll say this, the event of the rapture should never be mocked. The fact that God is coming and that He will judge the world for sin is something that we should never take lightly because it's in the Word of God. Let's flip over to John chapter 14. John chapter 14, what we're considering now is the certainty of the rapture. It's contained in all of the Bible, but what I'm going to focus on here for just a little bit is the words of Jesus Christ Himself and how often and consistently Christ in the flesh said, I'm going to come back someday and you'd better take that seriously. John 14 verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in Me. This is in my Bible words of red, meaning it's Jesus Christ speaking Himself. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Okay, he's going to go to the Father. He's going to prepare them a place. The word there for mansion means abode, place, house, or mansion. That's what he's talking about. He's preparing a place right now while he's gone where we will go one day to be with him and God the Father. Verse 3. And if I go and prepare a place for you, again, not actually questioning it, but comparing it, he just said for certain, I'm preparing you a place. And since I'm preparing you a place, I want you to know the next phrase. I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. With no equivocation, with no oscillating, with no doubt, Jesus Christ said, I will come again. I'm going to give you machine gun style here real fast, a whole bunch of scriptures that I'm going to read to you, and every single one of them are in the Gospels, Jesus himself claiming again with no doubt or question that he would someday come back again. Matthew 24, 27. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Verse 37. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Verse 44. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Jesus speaking to John in Revelation 22, verse 7, and then again in verse 20. Behold, I come quickly. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. 
Matthew 16, 27, For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of His Father. In Matthew 26, when they were trying Jesus, there's an interesting verse in verse 63 and 64. It says that Jesus held His peace, and then the high priest asked Him. The high priest said, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. One more, Luke 9, 26. For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory. Jesus Christ himself said over and over again, someday I'm coming back. Take some time this week and read Matthew 24 and Matthew 25. Yes, it's confusing and we'll reference some of that in a little bit, but just read Matthew 24 and 25 and decide for yourself, did Jesus clearly say, someday I'm coming in the clouds, someday I'm coming back to earth, someday I'm going to claim the throne and execute judgment and rule and reign? And the answer is yes, he did. C.S. Lewis said of Jesus Christ, he had a famous sort of theory and conclusion that was called liar, lord, or lunatic. And he said if Jesus went around saying, I'm God, I'm the only way to heaven, if you don't believe in me, you're going to be punished in hell forever. If Jesus said that over and over again and said he was God and said he was claimless, said he was sinless, there's only three conclusions, three possibilities. Either he's a liar, he knew he wasn't God, but he said it anyway. He's a lunatic, he's crazy, he actually thinks it and it's not true, or else he is Lord and he actually is God and he actually meant what he said. And of course, that's what we believe to be true. But his point was Jesus could not be a good man if he intentionally claimed to be God but was not. He could not be a good man and a, a sane man at the same time and say, I'm the only way to the Father if he knew it was not true or if he believed it to be true and it was not. People will say, well, the Bible's a good book and teaches us a lot of good things, but it's not really the Word of God. Not possible. Because the Bible over and over again claims to be the very words of God. It's not possible that Jesus was just a prophet and a good man who taught us how to live, but he wasn't really God. That can't be true. He wouldn't be a good man if he over and over again claimed to be something he was not. And of course we believe that the only logical conclusion is that he is God. He is Lord. Everything he said is true. And I think we can put the second coming of Christ into that same category. Meaning, he promised it was going to happen. So if it doesn't happen, if we don't believe it's going to happen, that would mean that Jesus isn't God, that He's a false prophet, and that what He said is not actually and literally true. If you ask me, why do I believe in the rapture? Why do I believe Jesus is coming back someday? As He came again, it's because God said it, and I choose to believe God. It is certain. In Acts 1, 9-11, again, all the rest of the Bible backs up this teaching, but I wanted to focus for a moment on the fact that Jesus said, it so many times. In Acts 1, 9 through 11, Jesus ascended up into heaven. The disciples watched him literally go upwards and disappear into the clouds, and they stood there. And the angel came and said, Why stand ye here gazing? This same Jesus shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go. He went up into the clouds. Someday he's coming back in the clouds, just like he promised. One more verse, Revelation 1, 7. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see see him and they also which pierced him and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him he's coming back the bible has promised that it is so in Daniel chapter 5, we see the story of a wicked king named Belshazzar of the Babylonians. And one night, he was having a drunken feast with all the leaders of his nations. And they had already been to Jerusalem and taken God's people captive. God allowed it to happen as an act of judgment against Israel. And while they were there taking people captive and ransacking the city, the soldiers of the Babylonians went into the temple of God, the house of God, the Old Testament, and they stole and took the things that had been dedicated to God in holy worship to Him, instruments of gold and of silver that belonged to God. And they got drunk while they were at this feast. 
The Bible unequivocally warns over and over again against drunkenness and calls it wrong. And in his drunkenness, the king Belshazzar said, I know what we should do. Send someone to get those instruments that we took out of the house of Jehovah God and let's pour our alcohol in it and drink out of them and keep on having a good times. And they brought it in before the king and that which was holy and consecrated to God. They put alcohol in it. It says he passed it out to his men, to his concubines, to all the people. And while they were there having a good time, what happened next, he no doubt could have never imagined. And let's just say this, the world today may rage and go on in their sin against God and think that God's not going to do anything about it. But God said one day He will judge the earth for their sins. And as King Belshazzar sat there and was drinking out of those things in this wicked act, the Bible says he looked and his countenance was troubled within him and his knees were loosed and they started to knock together and he was afraid because the Bible says there appeared a man's hand writing upon the wall. That might disconcert you a little bit too. You see a hand come out of nowhere and start to write on the wall. And it was a phrase that no one knew what the language was. They couldn't translate it. It was, meeny, meeny, tekel, you farson. And he called all of the wise men of the Babylonians and the Chaldeans and all of his spiritual advisors that did not believe in God. And they couldn't tell him what it said. And then he called for Daniel because he had a testimony that he knew the God of Israel and he could translate mysteries. And he looked up and he said, this is the translation of it. What the words mean, the first word means that God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. In other words, he set an appointed time when you will be cut off and he's finished your kingdom. The next word meant thou art weighed in the balances and found wanting. And then the last phrase meant your kingdom has been taken from you and will be given to the Persians. And then the word of God says that very night his life was taken from him. Hence we have a phrase that has survived till this day. And as many of our phrases and terms that we may not even realize come directly from the King James Bible. You will hear someone say the phrase, the handwriting is on the wall. What does that mean? It means it's been declared. It hasn't happened yet, but it's about to happen for sure. And this morning the handwriting is on the, wor- is on the wall. This world is on a collision course with the judgment of God. And they may continue on thinking that God will not keep His promises. But if God said it, it is certain and He has declared it. We see wickedness about us each and every day. And sometimes I go off on... I I even wrote down specifics that I'm just going to skip over this morning. But what we see going on around us, we see a lot of sin and a lot of wickedness and a lot of people denying God. Children's shows that are targeting them with the messages of evil of our day. Well, God said, woe unto them that call good evil and evil good. He is watching. He has no doubt weighed this world in the balances and found them wanting. And their freedom to continue rejecting God will not go on forever. He will come back. And He is going to judge the earth. God said it. It is certain. Number one, the certainty of the rapture. Number two, the imminency of the rapture. There's a word that is imminent. It's different than the word eminent. The word imminent, this is the definition. It means ready to take place, happening soon, looming. The very root of the word has to do with the idea of overhanging. It's not here yet. We don't know exactly when it's coming, but it's hanging over and it is going to happen. And then the definition is given, likely to occur at any moment. Now... There's a difference in saying Jesus Christ is coming back tomorrow and in saying Jesus Christ could come back tomorrow. The first one is wrong. The second one is accurate. We're going to look at a few different texts here in a moment where Jesus over and over again told His disciples the main point of the passage is you do not know when I am coming therefore be ready and serve me. I'm not, I don't believe we're supposed to be looking for the Antichrist. I believe we're supposed to be looking for the Christ. Or as one person said, I'm not spending every day looking for the undertaker, but rather for the uppertaker. It's not wrong to plan 
plan for the future, but I don't believe my primary responsibility right now is to lay up ammo and food and water because when the Antichrist comes, I'm expecting to go out into the wilderness and hide. I believe my responsibility is to live for Christ. And as he told his disciples, right before he ascended back up into heaven, Acts chapter 1, they asked him for about the thousandth time, well, at this point, will you set up your kingdom? They were so focused on that. And he lovingly turned and reminded them one more time, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father alone has in His hands. What did he say next? But ye shall be witnesses unto me when the Holy Spirit is given. Wait for the Holy Spirit. Then Jerusalem, Judea, and all the earth, go give the gospel. That's the job of the church, is to give the gospel, live for Jesus Christ, and know that He may come back 30 years from now, or He may come back 3 days from now. We are supposed to be ready. As I'll explain here in a moment, that is one of the primary reasons why I believe that that rapture, which is different in the way it is explained from Him actually coming to earth, why I believe it's preached tribulation because he over and over again hammered the fact it could happen at any moment. You don't know. You're not going to have a warning. In Matthew chapter 24, we'll read from there in just a moment if you would like to turn. In Matthew chapter number 24, the disciples asked Christ three different questions. They said, when is the temple going to be destroyed? What is the sign of thy coming? And when shall the end of the world be? So I personally believe that in the chapter, he talks a little bit about all of those things and that sometimes he's talking about that coming to the earth to rule and reign. And then sometimes he switches up and talks about when that whole thing will be kicked off by his coming and reminds them to be ready. I need to stop and look at my notes for one moment because i got to see where I'm at. Okay, so the rapture and the second coming to the earth, the final coming to the earth, are different. Here's the point I wanted to make. The final coming where Christ actually comes to earth, sets up His kingdom, is not an imminent event. What do you mean by that? Meaning it cannot happen today because there are too many events that first of all have to take place. Earlier on in Matthew chapter number 24 and verse 15, Jesus said, when you see the abomination of desolation take place. What is that? That's what Daniel prophesied about. He said, then for that next three and a half years, there's going to be the worst persecution the world has ever known. And then when all that is over... He says later around verse 29 and 30, you'll see the Son of Man coming with His angels to set up the kingdom. So Jesus can't come with His angels today to set up His kingdom because there has to be a worldwide leader that makes a covenant with the Jews that turns on them halfway through that makes the entire earth get a mark either in their right hand or in their forehead and worship them. And three and a half years after that takes place, then Jesus will come back to the earth. So it's not imminent. There's specific events that have to take place first. However, Jesus also warned His disciples to be ready because I'm coming back at a moment you don't expect. And I believe that rapture of 1 Thessalonians 4 is an imminent event. Meaning we don't know when it's going to happen, but it's going to happen soon and it could happen any time. I will note that in the book of Joel, there was a prophecy given of when the Holy Spirit was going to be given, and it said that in the last days, the Holy Spirit's going to be given. And when Peter preached on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter number 2, he said it was once prophesied in the last days, the Holy Spirit's going to be poured out. And this is happening now. So whether last days means almost at the end of days, or just in that last dispensation, we're in a time period that God Himself has already called the last days. Meaning He's going to come, He's going to come soon, we just don't know when. It could be a hundred years, it could be a hundred days, we don't know. I hope you're staying with me this morning. I know I'm getting slightly off track. But I saw a video one time of a man on YouTube who was preaching. And he said, I'll know exactly when the rapture is going to take place. Because when I see the abomination of desolation happen on TV, I'll know I have exactly these many days till Jesus is coming. 
I don't believe that's what the Bible teaches because Christ spoke of an imminent coming. Let's look to the scripture here. Let's get in as many of these as we can. Remembering that in Matthew 24, three questions were asked, some of it, and people will come and say, well, it says in verse 29 and 30, after the tribulation, you'll see him coming. Doesn't that mean it's after? And as I explained, I think that part of the time it's talking about when the tribulation is over and he comes to the earth, but there are many times when he switches up and talks about there is a coming, that you'll have no idea when it is. God, please help me now. Let's, let's go to the Bible because I'm getting off track. Matthew 24 and verse 36. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Then he describes the conditions of what it will be like when he's ready to come. But as the days of Noah were, so also shall the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall two be in the field, one shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken and the other left. And I have a rabbit trail that I'm not going to chase and I'm going to stay on point here. Now, the point of why I'm reading this is that Jesus said there will be a coming where those who do not know him will not be expecting anything. It's like the days of Noah. They're eating, they're drinking, they're partying. They didn't know anything. They had warning, but all of a sudden the flood came and it was upon them. Okay, then we'll read, let's continue verse number 42. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. The same people won't know when he's coming either. But know this, that if the good men of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore, what's the point? Be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not the Son of man cometh. And in the verses that follow, he, he says, be a faithful servant that is ready for when his Lord comes, that is not taken back by it or shocked or surprised. My master came back today. I had no idea. Verse 50, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him and in an hour that he is not aware of. What is the context? What is the point of what Jesus is saying? He says that if you knew when a thief was going to break into your house, you would get up and be ready to meet them. But a thief doesn't come that way. He doesn't send you a telegram. A telegram? Why did I say a telegram? I think it would be a text message. I don't know, but that would be weird if he didn't send a telegram. Hey, at 2 o'clock in the morning, I'm going to break into your house tonight. No, they use what? The element of surprise when you least expect it. And Jesus said that's why there were movies made in the 70s and all these things about Jesus coming back. And they called it what? A thief in the night. Because Jesus said, when I come, I'm coming as a thief in the night. Completely unexpected. By surprise. Now, I believe that what we read here in Matthew chapter 24, that the conditions described in this passage can't be describing a post-tribulation coming, Jesus coming at the end of that seven-year period for two different reasons. First of all, the saved would literally be able to know the amount of days until His coming by comparing what Jesus said about and Daniel said about what's going to happen halfway through. Literally to the day we could pick when Jesus is coming back if we were going to be here the whole time and he was coming at the end. And then also the lost. Verse 37 through 41 compares it to the days of Noah and talks about their eating, their drinking, their marrying, their giving in marriage. Everything's continuing and then all of a sudden Jesus comes and the judgment begins to be unfolded. The book of Revelation tells us that during the last seven years the entire world world will be in a chaotic state of hellish destruction. There's vials, there's trumpets, there's plagues, there's death, there's meteors falling out of the sky and rivers turning to blood and a third of the earth dying and then a third of the earth dying again. All of these horrible things. It's not really going to be like the days of Noah. So I believe that it doesn't make sense if he was talking about coming back at that end time. Another reason is that if you read Matthew chapter 25, the end of Matthew 25, beginning around verse 30, it says Jesus will come to the earth physically. Before Him will be gathered all nations. He'll separate the sheep from the goats and then set up the kingdom. The sheep are those who are saved that are entering the millennial kingdom. Okay, are you with me? The 
the goats are the lost who are going to be sent to hell. Now, if Jesus is going to come leave us here for all the seven year period, which again, it just to me doesn't fit with the teaching of the Bible. He said in Jeremiah, it's going to be a time of Jacob's trouble. It's going to be Israel's persecution, not the church. So if Jesus were to come in the clouds at the end of it, we've all been here the whole time, and he's going to rapture us up to the clouds, and then we all come right back down. Well, how then is this separation taking place of the sheep and the goats? The one is an event where the saved go up to the clouds. The other is an event where the angels go separate those who are lost, like a reverse rapture. The one is pulling out the church. The other one is pulling out those who are lost. I believe in the pre-tribulation rapture because I believe the coming of Jesus Christ is imminent, meaning it could happen at any moment. Let's look at Luke chapter 12. I'm sorry, Mark chapter 13. I'm going to cut out Luke 12, but Luke 12, 35 through 46 also fits very well with what we're talking about here. But Mark 13 and verse 31 is so clear. Mark 13, beginning in verse 31. Jesus again, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. But of that day and of that hour knoweth no man. Know not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Okay, so what is the message to the church? What is the point to the church if we don't know when He's coming? Verse 33, Take ye heed, watch, and pray, for ye know not when the time is. The whole point is serve me like I could be coming back today or tomorrow. I don't see a warning in here. I don't see Jesus saying, well, someday you'll know you have three and a half years. Someday you'll know you have seven years till I'm coming. He said, be ready. I'm coming like a thief in the night. Verse 34, For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey, who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to every man his work and commanded the porter to watch. So Jesus is like the master of a house who left servants in charge, but wanted them to be ready whenever he came back. Verse 35, Watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh, at even, or at midnight, or at the cock crowing, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. Thief in the night, morning, midnight, noon. We don't know. Jesus said, be ready. Don't be looking for the Antichrist. Be looking for me. It could happen any moment. It is an imminent event. And as one more side note, I'll say the mid-tribulation rapture, I've watched the documentaries, I've heard it, I just don't see any evidence for the fact that he's coming three and a half years through. To me, it's one or the other, and I believe it's beforehand, because however you want to slice it, whatever your opinions are, however much I've confused you this morning, I wanted you to get the point, it's certain, and it's imminent. Jesus said it could happen any moment, so be ready. Be faithful. Watch. Serve. Because you don't know when I'm coming. It could be at any moment. That's the main takeaway I want you to get so far. The whole point is to be ready. And in John 14, 1 through 3, I guess there was one more side note. Jesus said, we read it. He said, I'm going to prepare a place to you where the, for you where the Father is. Someday I'll come back and I'll take you that where I am, there ye may be also. When he comes to earth for the final time, he's going to set up his kingdom on earth, and at the end of that time period, heaven and earth will pass away, and there will be a new heaven and a new earth. But there is going to be an event where he comes, gets us, and takes us to where he's been in the meantime. I think it's before the tribulation, and it's imminent. It's certain... It's going to happen. It's imminent. It could happen at any moment. Number three, and we'll be done. Number three, the finality of the rapture. The finality of the rapture. As I was thinking about how to describe exactly what I meant by that, here's a couple of different thoughts. It is going to be for many the final opportunity to be saved. Now, I believe that people will still come to God because God is merciful during that final period, and the Bible talks about that. But in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, it talks about the Antichrist and him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and lying wonders. And then it says why God will allow him to do this. That with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, why? Because they received not the love of the truth, 
that they might be saved. Verse 11 and 12 says that God Himself will send a strong delusion that they all should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So I believe the Bible specifically teaches that if you've heard the gospel, you understood it, the Holy Spirit drew you, God pleaded with your heart, and you hardened it and rejected it and said, I don't want Jesus Christ, that when that time period comes where the Antichrist is on earth, God will allow you to be given over to those delusions to believe that lie. If you've heard the gospel and rejected it, I don't personally believe you will get saved during that time period. Another way that there's a finality to the event of the rapture is as Christians, our works we do for Christ. He's called us unto good works. Jesus said, Behold, the night cometh when no man can work. Our opportunity to serve God will be over. Then I thought about this, there's a general sense in which it will kick off the final chain of events before the earth itself will cease to even exist. Jesus said it's like a fig tree. You see the the signs on it that it's about to blossom, it's about to happen. In like manner in that last generation when you see the Antichrist and all these things happening, then know it's near even at the doors, it's here. And it will unfold like God said, and it will be the end of history, the end of humanity, the end of all of it. And it could happen at any moment. Death hangs over us all. It could happen at any time. In like manner, the rapture hangs over us all, saved or unsaved, as a certain event that is going to kick off the final chain of events of all human history. Time will not slow down or reverse. On American Family Radio, there's a program called Exploring the Word that we used to listen to sometimes, and John and I were just talking about it last night, and people would call with their Bible questions, and Alex McFarland was taking questions, and one guy called in and he said, hey man, have you heard about this particle accelerator machine they're making? I think when that thing goes off, it's going to reverse time. I don't know if he was watching the the Flash or if he was actually watching the news or what, but he said, it's going to start reversing time. And the Bible teacher said, now, now, stop that. He said, time is marching irrevocably forward to the day of judgment where Christ will be king. We're not going to be able to go back and do it over again. We're not going to be able to receive Christ as Savior if we rejected Him while we are alive. We will not be able to go back and give our life in loving works of sacrifice and offerings to Him again when it's over. What I want us to know is that the end is coming and it will be final And what's the point? We need to be ready. I get these notifications on my phone that pops up and they say this day one year ago or this day six months ago and it's fun to look back and remember what we were doing. And I never forget the first time last year my my daughter will be two at the end of October and something popped up from six months ago on my phone and I looked at it and I almost got a little teary eyed and I told my wife, I said, I don't remember her. Like that. It was only six months ago, but you're so focused on the seasons that when they start walking or talking, it's hard to remember what they were like when all they could do was crawl or when they couldn't crawl. And the point is, the Word of God tells us we only have one life. And as the song says, only what's done for Christ will last. The doctrine of the rapture is a purifying doctrine. It's meant by Christ to tell us, watch Serve me. Be ready. Know that your opportunities are limited and will soon slip away. And live for Jesus Christ. And the seasons change. It's turning cool. There's football on. We, we have this, it's fun, it, this rhythm of life. But we're also reminded we only have so many trips around the sun. We only have so many seasons. We only have one life to give to Jesus Christ. And I refuse to believe that this mortal coil of suffering and pain and confusion is all there is. Why? Why do you believe that? I believe that because God has said, this is not all there is. And I choose to believe God. Shakespeare wrote a play and at one point a character in the, in the play expressed his exasperation. And he said, life is a tale told by an idiot, full of rage and fury, signifying nothing. Take Jesus Christ out of our life this morning. And that's what it would be. But we find meaning. We find hope. 
because we have found the truth in Jesus Christ and we believe that what He has said is true. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 25. I want to read you this passage and then we'll be dismissed. I was able to go to a, a funeral just a couple weeks ago of a family that years ago, their children used to ride the church bus and come here probably a good 20, 25 years ago. And it was people that I would think, yeah, I remember them, but I wonder if they would remember me. And now their kids were all adults. And the one came up to me and said, I remember you and your, your siblings, your brothers were Jason, and then it was Rachel, Rebecca, and then the little one was John, right? And I said, yep, that was it. And they talked about coming to church and the one woman who, who is an adult now and has her own family. She says, what I remember when I remember your church is sitting in the pew in your dad's presence when he preached. And she said something along the effect of larger than life or dynamic as a little kid to watch him preaching. And I said, he, he's got that presence that I don't think I'll ever have myself as a dynamic speaker. And then the other one went and he said, because it was near the end and they had started packing up uh, different, they had displays put out and pictures of their mom who was only 54 years old but that died from complications of COVID. And he said, look, I want to show you this. And he went and he dug in a bucket of all these pictures and he said your mom made this for my mom 15 years ago. It was that little plaque that said the, the name of the family established with this date and I remembered she used to make that and give that to everybody and there was another lady there who I remembered from when I was probably 5 or 6 years old and I said you used to own a dry cleaning business didn't you? And she said yeah you're the pastor's son you were so little and she said your dad is a good man. She said whenever he brought his clothes in I said I'm not going to charge you. You work for God. I'll clean your clothes for free. What, what, what's the point? I got home and I was thinking about it and I was talking to Melissa and I said, when God gives us an opportunity to minister to people, it is such a precious thing that should not be taken lightly that maybe 20 years from now there'll be someone who's in this church that gets called to another place but that will look back and say, I remember when we were there and I remember what you preached and I remember what God did. Our opportunities are precious and we are supposed to live for God because they are limited. I'm sorry, I, the clock is running out again, but Matthew 25, I'm going to read this straight through and then be done. Matthew chapter 25 and verse number 1. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. And while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. Most people think the interpretation of this parable is that oil is a picture of the Holy Spirit. They were supposed to wait for the bridegroom to come. Jesus calls the church His bride and Him the bridegroom as a figurative picture of their relationship. And they were told, be ready, the, the, be ready, the bridegroom's coming at any moment. Well, five of them were ready. They had the oil. They were saved. They had Christ. And five were not. Verse 6, And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. There's a song called the midnight cry when Jesus comes again. And it's taken out of this verse. And what it's saying here in the text is that midnight, He didn't announce exactly when He was coming. But at a moment when the saved didn't know for sure. And when the lost didn't know for sure. He just showed up. And there was a finality to it. Therefore, we're supposed to be ready. Verse 7, Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go rather to buy to them that sell and buy for yourselves. You cannot get saved because your family is saved. You cannot get saved because you went to church. You have to know Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Verse 10, And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Some finality. You weren't ready, you don't get in. In Revelation 19, it talks about an event called the marriage supper of the Lamb that I believe the Bible is saying will be taking place in heaven while the tribulation is happening on earth. But those who weren't ready missed it. The door was shut. They didn't get to go in. Verse 11, Afterward came the other virgin saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. In other words, there was a time period where the Master came. They weren't ready. The door was shut. They missed it. But after the supper was over, there came a time when they faced Him. 
in like manner when Christ gets the church and takes us to the marriage supper of the Lamb, the door will be shut. Some will miss it. But afterward, there will be a judgment time when they will face Christ afterwards. But it has been too late. Verse 12, But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know ye not. What is the purpose? Verse 13, Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as Rachel comes, and we'll have a time of music and of playing. I know we preached long this morning, but I pray God that if anybody missed part of what I was saying, or if I got too technical, or if there's things we disagree with, that we would remember Christ is coming. It is certain. It's imminent. He could come at any time. And it's final. There will be no going back. May we have our main takeaway when we study prophecy to be Jesus is coming. God, please help my heart to be ready. Let's continue in an attitude of prayer. If there's anyone here who doesn't know Christ as Savior today, I would beg you, receive Christ as Savior. Let us talk to you about that if you need it. Let's have the music play and let's have a time of prayer.